<laughs> All right. Okay, we're, we're ready to go for real now. So, uh, in that video uh, that I just played, um, <clears throat> it was talking about the way that a lot of, uh, well, not a lot, but, but a few, um, quite a few uh, kids recently have um, raped someone and, as far as a judge, a judge is concerned, gotten off mostly, you know, scot-free. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, very, very little thi uh, things to account for. That guy basically got a slap on the wrist for, for two or counts of rape. Yeah. I mean, it's not like he might have done a little, I mean, two counts, one of which he actually said he did. See what I mean? So, uh, anyways, um, that takes us to, to um, kind of build on what we've been talking about before we get too far on this church discipline um, topic here. Uh, and that's the idea of the difference between social justice from church justice. Okay? Right off, can you guys tell me any differences that you can tell between social justice and church justice? I mean, like, back in the Old Testament, they even put people to death for certain things. So, I mean, like, the church doesn't do it now because we have a law system. But, I mean, <laughs> as far Gracie as... Gracie got her game face on for that. Did you see that? <laughs> like, she's ready to stone some people up. Yeah. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, what? <laughs> as, far wow. as, as far as, like, what we believe and what the law believes, it's, it's, it's about the same, I think. Okay, so we have a, it's the same. Do we have any, any either um, answers agreeing with her or answers disagreeing with her? You guys all have been quiet. No comments? Ben, surely you're not gonna let this go unchallenged. <laughs> Come on, Ben. <laughs> you haven't been here in so long. <laughs> I'm just gonna start eating churros if you guys don't start talking because oh my god, this is really good. <laughs> Actually go ahead and talk and I'll still eat churros. <laughs> Well then, fine. Uh, there's actually quite a few differences between social justice and church justice. First off, in church justice, the more mercy you ha have, <clears throat> usually causes things to work better. Mm -hmm. Whereas in social justice, the more mercy you have makes things worse. worse. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'll give you an example. As a pastor, you're going to have a lot of people <coughs> gossiping and backbiting. It's just people. The people do that. I mean, it's not like, oh, that's a bad church. No, there's always going to be those people who exactly. gossip and backbite. Um, but when you're dealing with these people as a pastor, you do it with patience. And you don't, you know, you don't jump down the throat because you heard them do it. You, you treat them the way that, you know, in such a way where, where they actually learn from the experience because you want them to grow spiritually. All right. right? Mm -hmm. But in a social setting... If you hand out mercy, the, your government is not actually governing effectively. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, now, I'm not saying you have to enjoy giving someone the electric chair, but at the same <laughs> time, you yeah. can't let rapists yeah. go without any kind of a... Consequence. You know I mean? Now, I'm not saying well, if a rape happens at a church, yeah. that's different. No, no, it should still be reported. But it's not the place of a pastor to pull the, to pull the electric chair... Whereas it is, is the place of a, of a prosecutor to do that. See what I mean? Yeah. They have different jobs. See what I mean? So the, in the church, we're interested in reconciliation. Restoring people in relationship to God and other people. But the government isn't interested in that. 
their interest in maintaining the law so that yeah. there isn't chaos. Right. You know what I mean? Um, the reason, Gracie, why the church doesn't kill people, <laughs> goodness <laughs> sakes, no is way. because we're not, we're not under the law anymore. Right. And uh, also, keep in mind that the Jews were under a different governmental system than the yeah. Christians are. Yeah. The Jews were actually supposed to establish themselves as a theocratic um, government where God was their, was their, basically their king, and then they, they followed things, you know, a little bit differently. But once again, Christians were never called to establish a, a uh, government kind of yeah. thing. They were just called to spread God's kingdom, the eternal kingdom, regardless of what is happening in the, in the present kind of situation. See what I mean? Yeah. So. Well, I figured that whole thing was... No stoning. No, I know that. <laughs> saying, we don't do that anymore because we have a law set up of set by the government so we don't okay I was just making sure you understood because I didn't know if you were going to like try and kill somebody <laughs> you were talking crazy you had the crazy eye doctress <laughs> <laughs> okay so it is important to realize that when we're talking about discipline we're talking about things that work in the church that don't necessarily work in society do you know what I mean um, for instance let's say somebody rapes somebody um, in the world, okay? This is just something that happens, like a guy rapes a girl, okay? Should he go one-on-one -on -one and try, or should she go one-on-one -on -one to him and try to bridge again? No, no. she should report it and, <laughs> and let the authorities handle it. Yeah. You know what I mean? But, okay, now let's talk about something else. Let's say he had just lied to her about something. No rape, no sexual immorality, nothing like that, okay? He just lied to her. Then should she go to him and try to make amends with this? Yes, yes of course, you know what I mean? <laughs> Totally different scenarios, you know what right. I mean? We're not talking about a, a, a legal issue, we're talking about a spiritual issue, you know what I mean? And when, and when we're dealing with church discipline, that's oftentimes the case. But here's, here's the real thing that really throws a wrench in it. A lot of times, if you're in ministry, eventually there's going to be things that come by your desk like, well, it turns out that this person is actually um, abusing his wife. And then as a pastor, you're kind of in a little bit of a tricky situation because at the same, like, there's a little, there's that confidence issue and you're trying to help them grow. Right. But at the same okay. time, you can't turn your back on someone who's being abused. See what I mean? So as a pastor, yeah. you get put in these very awkward, awkward situations that it's not an easy answer. Um, thank God we don't have to figure out on our own. Um, but, you know. So that's what I really wanted to emphasize as we get into today's lesson, the difference between social justice and church discipline. There are, there are differences there. And before we progress any further, if you know of something that is a, a, should be under the realm of social justice, you should definitely report it. If you know someone's being abused, if you know somebody who, who needs help with, with their addiction to alcohol or, or, or drugs or anything like that, get them the help that they need. I mean, goodness sakes. You know what I mean? It, it, it's an immoral thing to see somebody uh, stuck in such a problem and to turn your back on them. That, that is in itself is an immoral thing. Um, so, But going back to church discipline, um, we're talking about things like gossip. We're talking about things like um, being stuck in, in, in sexual immorality. We're talking about things like, um, you know, uh, uh, stealing and those kinds of things. We're talking about Things that that we're trying to make somebody in a right relationship with God. Okay. Um, so with that, we talked about we talked about being free from the law, right? You guys remember this? Mm -hmm. And we've talked about church discipline. And once again, watch next week's lesson because I'm I'm trying to just not really get too much into things, and I think it's just making things more confusing. Mm -hmm. um, which takes us kind of the, to this idea. Hopefully, you you have a basic understanding of those things. And if we are free from the law, why is there discipline within a church setting? Because remember, we're not... The Old Testament, that was specifically given to the Jews. Mm -hmm. We are not Jews, and we also under under the law of grace through Christ, who fulfilled the law. So why do we... Um, why is there discipline within a church setting then? Why don't we just kind of live our own things and then whatever things need to be taken care of by the police, let the police handle it. Mm. Well, I'm sure this isn't the answer, but Paul even was telling the church, um, you know, about the different things that you take care of in the church. Like the uh, guy that was sleeping with his mom or whatever. Okay. 
says, but that's so, what. So why does Paul tell him to do that since we're free from the law? Well, it's adultery, and aren't we still held by the Ten Commandments? Well, that was part of the law given to the Jews. So technically that was the law given to the Jews, not the Christians, so... Right. But even Jesus was saying stuff about the Ten Commandments. Okay. Which means what? He fulfilled the law. <laughs> Which means what? <laughs> Which means we're still held by it. But we just talked, we already talked about it a couple weeks ago that we're not held to the law. <laughs> um, I don't know. <laughs> I'll give you a more modern example, Grace. Okay. Hopefully this will get your what is going. In Paul's day, he talked to the Church of Corinth about um, not how they were accepting that, that sin, right? Right. And he said, why are you doing this? Even the world knows this is a bad thing. Well, in modern day, we actually have a lot of churches condoning homosexual activity, right? Um, which could be very easily compared to, to, right. to that to that event. So, why shouldn't we accept the homosexuals like that, or accept? I'm sorry, accept <laughs> homosexual activity. Right. Um, you guys all can answer. You don't have to leave Gracie in the in the in the ditch <laughs> all by herself. <laughs> um, well, I think it, the discipline in the church is because they don't want chaos. First of all, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, but is that the it's, only reason? No. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, if if everybody would start sinning, that's not called the church anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, you, you're just the same as what the world is doing. But can you really? Can you really work out sin from somebody from a tyrannical system? Like, for instance, if a pastor was to uh, institute rules and regulations um, just for the sake of maintaining uh, order in the church, is that really a church anymore, or is that a club that has a president? Because uh, yeah. aren't we saved by grace, not works? So what's the point of having a, tyr a, a, a dictator over the church? Well, we're still oh. under it. It doesn't mean if we're free from the law, we're still under the law of Christ. Right. Okay. So it doesn't mean we're free. So okay. I mean, what do you mean? We're under Christ and whatever, you know, Christ gave a law to for us to live under Okay. after he came. Why? And what does that mean for us? <laughs> First of all, God said he, does, he, he, he doesn't deal with sin. Mm -hmm. And whatever it's caused to be sin, God is not okay with it. Right. So, I mean, the church, of course, is going to have discipline to teach people what, what's the difference between sin and not. Sin. not well, you know. Right. right. Which means? <laughs> so we can better them and disciple them. <laughs> almost there, <laughs> almost there. We were we were close. No, we were close. We almost made it. Keep going though, guys. Yeah, we're, we're 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 dancing around the answer that I'm looking for. Nicole, why don't you hop in here, buddy? <laughs> the other thing that's really coming to my mind is to keep everybody's morals in line. Okay, mm -hmm. but isn't that the work of the Holy Spirit then? <coughs> it's it's just the way how. How it, how God uh, how it how it is how that is it's just <coughs> immoral it's just we just uh, how we do how we live life or uh, yeah this, see yeah. this is what this <coughs> is what I've been talking about how if you don't understand the Old Testament you're not going to understand the New Testament. And uh, that's why that's that's why we're looking at this, and and this is the time to be asking these questions because we're looking at it. So it's okay to not have the answers, guys. Mm -hmm. It's okay. What's important is that we continue to seek God for the answers, right? All right, All right. So um, let's back up real quick um, to a verse we looked up last week. If I can find it. Is it Jeremiah one? No. Oh, because I already. Oh no! But don't. Yeah, we are going to look at that later. Don't don't you guys talk about it yet. Ah. <laughs> Not yet. Oh, I, can, I don't know where, where we put it. Um, well, anyways. Oh, I wish I... 
I wish I remembered where in the lesson we put, I put that. Anyways, um, well, there's a few things that I think D Diana was dancing around that I was kind of trying to guide her to, <laughs> guide her to, but uh, missed it by that much. Um, part of the reason is because God is a holy God. Remember, just because we're free from the law doesn't mean that God's character has changed. Right. Okay. So just to reevaluate some things. Are we free from the law? Yes. Does that mean that we are allowed to live lawless? No. No. And why? Because God is a good God, right? right? Right. And if his dwelling is in our midst, that should mean even more so that our lives are dedicated to him. Not that we are perfect, right. but that our lives are dedicated to him. Mm -hmm. Right? I, I, was, I was hoping Diana was going to get there. I was, oh, I was, she almost did, too. You don't let me. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, Gracie, where were you, friend? <laughs> um. Okay, so the law was a contract given to Israel as a temporary guide. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. The, the law was just a temporary guide given in place until Jesus would come. Right. Galatians talks about this, so does Romans. But it becoming obsolete or, or um, um, no longer uh, over us does not mean sin is now okay. All right. See what I mean? But some people now try to still follow the law even though they're Christians. Like, for instance, I talked about this quite a few times. In the law, it talks about a few different things. It talks about not trimming the edges of your beard, not marking yourself. It goes through like three or four different things, which sounds like he's just saying, don't do these things. What he's actually saying is, don't worship the pagan gods. Right. And these are all practices that they were doing to worship the pagan gods. Yeah. See what I mean? So how does that apply to us today? Well, we still shouldn't worship other gods, should we? Mm. Don't. See what I mean? yeah. Are we dedicated to God? Well, yes. And if we're dedicated to God, then we wouldn't worship other gods anyways. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? That kind of makes sense? Kind of. So what is not the issue? Tattoos. Right? right. What's not the issue? The edges of your beard. Right. What is the issue? Seeking after God. Uh -huh. Right? Uh-huh. Okay. And um, don't worry too much about if you still don't understand the law, it's totally fine. Um, uh, I'm gonna keep. We're gonna keep talking about it throughout the course of discipleship. But then after um, here in a couple weeks, when we're done, when we are done with this discipleship, we're gonna hop back and start looking at Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and probably a little bit of Exodus as well. So, don't worry too much about it. Um, what is the purpose of the discipline that we've talked about in, in the church setting? We we talked about it just saying you now. The oh the. Being um, just because we're lawless. Oh, wait. No, 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 no. The purpose of the discipline. For discipleship? Yeah, in a roundabout way, yeah, but there was a specific thing I said, remember? I said it last week. Uh, for, what? Right, right. It's about spiritual restoration, right? Yeah. So, um, and don't worry, we're, we're coming to that question of the whole law thing. I'm just taking the scenic route there. Ah. Um, if we are free from the law, why is there discipline? We just talked about this, guys. Come on, don't leave me hanging. Come on, guys. <laughs> if we are free from the law, why is there discipline? Because we shouldn't live well. Yes, okay, yes. We're, we're, we're getting here. If we are dead to sin, how can we be, how can we also be alive to sin? All right. See, when we when we died with Christ, we that means we died to sin so that we could be raised up with them. But if we are dead to sin, how can we still be alive to sin? That's a contradiction. So if you live, you can either live your live your life for Christ or live your life for the flesh. But you can't have both. Right. See what I mean? So that takes us to Romans chapter six. If only somebody if somebody had said, "Oh, are we to continue in sin?" What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin? Oh, it is written in the Bible. Hooray! <laughs> I'm just kidding, guys. It's a joke. You can laugh. It's all right. I'm trying to make this lighthearted. <coughs> um, are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. 
How can did you, what did you say? I said may it never be. May it never be. <laughs> <laughs> By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Mm -hmm. See, it's a contradiction. Yeah. If we're still living in sin, that means we didn't really die to sin in the first place. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's an impossibility. Now he's not talking about sinning. Okay, total difference. We're all going to sin until the day that we die. But he's talking about embracing the lifestyle of sin. Embracing the old way of life, even though you've been set free from it. Mm -hmm. It's like an alcoholic who no longer has a problem with alcohol, so he goes back to alcohol to see if he has, still has a problem with it. <laughs> uh. See what I mean? No, by no means should you do this thing. All right. So then he continues on there in verse 3. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his what? His death. Mm -hmm. Okay? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Mm -hmm. Not a newness of death. Mm -hmm. See? He's raised us to newness of life, which means a changed life. It means a life dedicated to God. It has nothing to do with, to do with the law. The law showed us what, right, what was right and wrong, so that when Christ came we would have the fulfillment to that and we'd be set free. But the law didn't set anybody free from sin. Rather, the law bound people under sin until Christ would come. See? But now we've been set free because the Christ has come. But now, be since our faith is in Christ, does that mean we should live <coughs> however we want? No. Because we've died to that. So, so that we might walk in newness of life. He picks up in verse 5. For if we have been united with him in death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. So basically, giving up on those worldly, worldly lusts, right? The lusts of the flesh, we're giving up on those, and we're seeking after the Lord, right? So that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Jeremiah puts it like this. The law is written on their hearts. See, we have the Holy Spirit now. They didn't have it then. We have it written on our hearts. So we don't have to be dictators over people and, 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 tell, and point out every little thing. There is church discipline, right? Right. And when somebody is stuck in sin, we, we, do, we do try to draw them out, right? But it doesn't mean that every single time that a brother or sister's foot stumbles that we go and pounce on them and instantly tell them all the sin that they're doing wrong. No, no Ben. No. <laughs> like, let's say hypothetically, if Paul and Barnabas got into a fight and one was wrong, the other one would have to. <laughs> just kidding. Have his, have his good friend Luke record the incident. <laughs> Anyways, for one who has died has been set free from sin. One who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Is this kind of making sense now? Okay. Uh, so, um, basically, let me summarize what he's saying here. Are you going to mess up? Yes. However, do not allow yourself to live in that state of sin because you're dead to sin. Right? Not because the Old Testament law says, says so, but because the law on our hearts says so. We know what's wrong because the Holy Spirit is working in our hearts. Right? So, if we pay tithes, will God pour blessings upon blessings on us? No. We're not Jews. However, will God honor those who honor Him? Right. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. However... Can you, can you pull out one or two verses from the Old Testament and say, therefore I'm going to get everything that I set my heart on having? Uh, no. No. Okay? The Old Testament was also concerned with a plaque of land called Canaan. Are we looking forward to a small piece of land? No. Uh, Christians are going to inherit the earth. Uh, we don't want some, one small land from the earth. We want the whole thing. Well, Christians get the whole thing. <laughs> I mean, we're going to still live here? Well, in the new one. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Since you are dead to sin, since you count yourselves dead to sin, do not let sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, 
and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. Are you aware that it is an immoral thing to seek another God? Yes. Right? So why would you do such a thing? Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness. Are you aware, Diana, that it's wrong to steal Ben's car? So are you going to do it? See what I mean? Um, for sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law but under grace. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? Surely, since we are under grace, we should sin. By no means. Gracie, where were you? Do you not know that if you present yourself... And this is the last verse I want to read. If you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, mm -hmm. either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. Okay. See? Uh, what is it? The proof is in the pudding? Is that hmm. what people say? Uh -huh. Anyways, so, if we are dead to sin, how can we be alive to sin? That's why we have church discipline, because we still serve a holy God. And because right is still right, and wrong is still wrong. Okay? Now, obviously, church discipline should, should be few and far between. Some people just love church discipline. They just love hopping down people's throat. And it's like they actually think that they're going to maintain a church that doesn't have any problems simply by yelling at them or by cramming things down their throat. I mean, and they'll hop on anything. You know I mean? Even things that aren't even sin. You know? Chuck, you're getting a new wheelchair right here. You already have one. Sinful. Zach. Why are you here and not with your son? Sinful. Diana, you have a newer car. Sinful. Gracie, you're sitting here. Where's your son? See what I mean? Like, where, where they just try to... They do what the Pharisees did. Mm -hmm. Here's what's actually right and wrong, and to make sure that people don't get that far, we're going to set up a bunch of our own rules so that they never even get that far. That's what the Pharisees did. They made their right. own rules on top right. of the law that was already leading... That was already uh, holding people under sin. And then they made more rules on top of that that makes it a little more harder to see what I mean it, it, just, it didn't solve anything uh -huh. yeah. and so that what they, they tried to keep making more and more rules to help solve the spiritual problem <laughs> well the spiritual problem is resolved when people seek after God that's it yeah. that's it yeah. um, however because some people are going to be hardened um, there needs to be churches uh, there was one person who was just a, a real bad uh, gossip, and, I mean, they were spiteful about it, too. And everywhere they went, they were just causing problems. And so they had to be dealt with. Right to the back of the head. Just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> but they did have to be dealt with. And it, it, sadly, they were, not, they, they, were not, they were too prideful to repent of what they were doing, and so they eventually left the church. We did not kick them out of the church. They left because they couldn't submit themselves to, dis to discipline. Mm -hmm. But they were causing t they were causing a problem for the other people. That rapist, who was treated unjust by him being given mercy, the victim that he raped. Mm -hmm. See, in a church set setting, sometimes, sometimes you don't want to act, but sometimes you have to act because other people are going to get hurt if you don't. Yeah. Sometimes your patience will cause more people to not get hurt, but sometimes your inaction will cause more people to get hurt. Yeah. And you really have to balance it because it's not just a social issue. See, so social justice is really easy. If somebody rapes somebody, they go to jail. Well, unless nowadays. Yeah. Normally, in a normal yeah. setting, when somebody gets raped somebody, they go to jail. Right. But, I mean, whatever. Uh, it's kind of sim real simple black and white, but in church discipline, it's not always that easy. A lot of times, it's you'll so give funny. you'll give a lot of effort to somebody that you never see a reward from, and then you just have to let it go and still love the next person, hoping that they'll eventually change. That's difficult. I don't like it. So there. Um... Our freedom from the law is an excuse for immorality. Just because we are free from the law does not mean we are our own grandpa. I mean, our own <laughs> uh, God. <laughs> Goodness sakes, Ben's the only one laughing at my jokes. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> and, and I think that last one was just a pity laugh. He's like, <laughs> <laughs> So God is holy and we are dedicated to him as his disciples. Anything less is not a disciple. Now, I didn't say perfection. I said dedication. 
that God is your Lord and that's who you're going to serve and that's who you're going to answer to. Anything less is not discipline. Mm -hmm. If you're not dedicated to your master, then he's not your master. Right? See what I mean? Jesus put it like this. You can't serve money and God one's always going to one's always going to win out you know um, or god put it like this way back in the day one man and one woman should be joined together and so what do, what do men do well they start having more than one wife one more than one wife well in all those stories there was always a favorite wife wasn't there and there was always a not so favorite wife see what i mean <laughs> Well, which one's your wife? Well, they're both my wives, but there's the one that I love and the one that I just like. See what I mean? Y you can't have more than one mask. This is the one that we didn't even like, that we were just tricked into marrying. Ah! <laughs> Every marriage ever! I mean, um, <laughs> my marriage to Gracie is very solid. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Funeral services for Michael will be next week. <laughs> oh, you'll think I think I'll make it that long? Wow. He believes in me. <laughs> well, I just figured yeah. everyone would be at the zoo anyways. <laughs> a great monkey died this week. <laughs> okay. So that takes us to the question I asked last week. Who are we not supposed to pray for? I'm sorry. Oh my. <laughs> anyway, so seriously, who are we not supposed to pray for? Not to pray for or to pray to? Pray for. We're not supposed to pray for? And this is a trick question for those of you who actually went back and read Jeremiah. Pray for angels. An angel will never get saved. Oh, no, no, I am talking about people. Oh. But, but good answer, though. You were on top of that. <laughs> Boy, she was... <laughs> She's good. Oh, and let me save you the agony. I'm not talking about dead people either. So. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. <laughs> did, uh, did any of you guys get a chance to go back and read that passage? The passage, you just gave us a verse. Yeah. The passage. It doesn't yeah. make sense if you just read the one verse. Okay, so you read the one verse. Yeah. Okay. Who are we not supposed to pray for? The, uh, them, this people. Oh, you really just read the one verse. <laughs> yes. uh, oh, okay. Yeah. I was hoping that would pique her curiosity. <laughs> it didn't. <laughs> okay, alright. I'm trying to guess now since I wasn't here. <laughs> Diana's giving more effort and she wasn't even here. Nicole, Zach, <laughs> hey, Casey, wait, wait, wait. Well, Chuckle kind of heard part of it in a, in a meeting the other day. So. Uh, I mean, if you put the sense. Old Testament, you know, I, there. okay, this is my guess. Uh, do not pray for those that God got, um, uh, what's the word? Like, bring brings a wrath on it or something, you know what I mean? Yeah. She scored! I'm so proud of you! Really? Yes! Yes! You're so you! Gold star! You know what? You get a churro. It's on me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it could be. Um, I made it where it doesn't pop, where it doesn't, it all does it all at once. Oh. Oh no. Oh, what no. The? oh no. Okay. Okay, hold on, guys. Uh, oh no! Uh, uh, okay, hold on. <laughs> Meanwhile, the people that are watching the video are just rewinding the back and <laughs> pausing it. Right? <laughs> Almost there, guys. <laughs> okay. Uh, That's what I was going to say. Do what? What did you say? Nobody watches this far into it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> wah, wah. <coughs> okay. <coughs> so first off, church discipline is not for non-believers. Yeah. I thought we were talking about... Wait, I thought we were talking about praying, praying for, for people. Huh. Right. You asked, who are we not praying for? Right. But then you went to discipline. Yeah, I'll tie it in in the end. Oh, okay. <laughs> you guys, you think, I, you think I'm being absent-minded? 
I probably am. But I plan to tie it into the end. So, um, but in in this context, I am kind of sticking prayer and, and church discipline relatively close by, and I'm gonna do church discipline and I'll go and I'll bring um, prayer into it. Okay. So just kind of hold on for the ride. Okay. <laughs> well, it's not for non-believers. Yeah. Yeah. First <laughs> uh, Corinthians uh, five, and this is actually part of the problem that Christian that not that people who aren't Christians have with Christians is that they're too judgmental. But the problem is is Christians were never called to be judge and jury for the world. Right. Unless mm. they God called them to actually be a judge. Right? <laughs> right? <laughs> right? So First Corinthians chapter five verse nine says this I wrote you in my letter not to so associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and swindlers, idolaters, since then you would uh, need to go out of the world. But now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of the brother of bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed, or is an idolater or viler, drunkard or swindler. Not even excuse me, to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those who uh, inside the church uh, whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. Okay? So and then that takes us to kind of the idea of prayer. And a lot of times people will try to pray for someone of the world like they're of, like they're of the church. You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm. Oh, God, that you would forgive them and, 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 and all these different things. It's like, well, now hold on. Okay, we'll, we'll get there, but just hold on. Um... But the, and, and and so that kind of leaves us this: as soon as pe somebody will get saved, instantly somebody will will, will kind of have this mentality: they're saved. Now I can tell them all that they are doing wrong. <laughs> nah. Well, that's kind of wrong that's, too, then, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and we're not talking about those struggling; we are talking about genuinely unsaved people. Okay. Because a lot of times we try to play God. Oh well, I saw that person struggling the other day, so they're not really a Christian. Okay, A, you're not God, so you don't really know that, do you? Right. I'm pretty, can pretty convinced that a lot of people who look the part of Christian aren't going to make it into heaven. And I'm pretty c convinced that there's going to be a lot of people who are going to say, wait, they made it? Because mm -hmm. it's in their heart, mm -hmm. not in what you saw. Right. See what I mean? But then with that being said, um, also, uh, remember, you don't just simply lose your salvation because you're struggling. Uh. Remember? So... <laughs> If claiming freedom you defile your body, you are enslaved. So if someone claims that they are a Christian, but actually they are not a Christian, like is a really common in the American church, for instance, um, they aren't really a Christian, and you really can't pray for them as though they were a Christian. You have to kind of pray for them as though they were not a Christian, because they are not a Christian. Does that make sense? Uh -huh. Kind of make sense? So. And the second uh, group there, uh, once believers who have hardened their hearts. People who used to be a Christian but are no longer a Christian. Okay, First John chapter 5. And there's a lot I could say about First John, so I'm going to try and keep my remarks somewhat limited. Um, which is kind of hard on this passage, but you know, if I go too long, Chuck's supposed to throw a shoe at me or something. So, <laughs> If anyone sees his brother committing a sin, not leading to death, he shall ask and God will give him life. No. What? Let me read it again and actually pay attention to what I'm saying here. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask God and God will give him life. To those who commit sins that do not lead to death. There is sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. Oh, there it is. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who is born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Okay? So, thoughts on what I read. What did you guys notice from what I just read? That much? <laughs> Did anything stick out to you guys? Sin that doesn't lead to death and sin yeah. that lead to death. Okay, what does that mean, do you think? Like, I mean, if you stole a pan, doesn't mean you're gonna die. 
Okay. So you think it's got to do with severity of the sin? Right. Okay. Uh, any contesters for that view, or anybody wanting to agree with that view? I think it has to do with their heart. Okay. With their heart, can you elaborate a little bit, though? The sin that would lead to death is an intentional you're just going out and sleeping. Okay. Purpose. But you don't think it has to do with the sin itself so much as the sinner. Okay. Uh, Zach, what were you going to say? I was going to agree, actually agree with both. How so? I'm curious as to how you do this one. Because <laughs> he said it was about the sinner and she said it was about the sin, so... Well, you? a little bit of both. It depends on the severity of the of the sin itself. Okay. And what's the motive? Okay. Of the sin. Okay. Uh, He's getting fancy on this. <laughs> Whoa. Anybody else? I agree with Chuck. It, I think it depends on the heart and um, what what there's you know, what their thoughts are during the, during the sin, you know, like, um, someone gossips, and then afterwards they're like, oh crap, I didn't mean to do that, or someone, you know, intentionally says, okay, today, I'm gonna go to Michael, and I'm gonna tell him what Diana did, oh my gosh, it's gonna be so juicy, I can't wait to see his reaction. You know, yeah, I think it depends on the you told, I thought you told me not to mention it Diana. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> I, I think, I think, I, I agree with Chuck, I think it depends on the heart. Okay, well, let's put a pin in that and go to the other part of that same verse, um, where it said, um, Where is it? Okay, right here. Um, he shall ask, and God will give him life. What do you think that's saying? Even though you meant to do it, you did it on purpose, but then you do repent later, mm-hmm. God, God will forgive you. Right, but it didn't say that. It said, you pray for them, and they will receive life. Oh, well, that's about somebody else. Yeah. I'll, I'll read it again so you guys can hear it again, okay? Um, if anyone sees his brother committing a sin, not leading to death, he shall ask, and God will give him life. Okay, so I have an example. Okay. So, like, let's say somebody is doing wrong to me, and they're doing it on purpose. I mean, God is going to look at my heart. How do I react to it? Okay. Am I going to be forgetful? Am I going to just forget about it? Or am I going to bark back at it? Okay. So if I just drop it and say, just Lord, just, you know, forgive him and just keep on going. Lord might just not even, you know, because he wants to see how my heart reacts to it. Mm-hmm. Even though he, in his heart, he thinks, oh, I got her, you know. And he's, uh, you know what I mean? Like the other person is going with their own motive. And sh- and he, she, whatever, is sinning. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Um, I do see what you're saying. And that's a good thought. But I I, um, I want to back you up here. Um, this verse is specifically talking about the other person getting life. Right. That's what I'm saying. Uh, whatever reaction. Let's say you're doing something wrong to me. Mm-hmm. And you have a heart that I'm going to get her. Okay, you're going to do it intentionally wrong. Okay. Well, I am not going to pay attention to it. I'm going to pray for you, and God will not consider your sin for for what you did because of the way I reacted to it. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm hoping that I'm understanding you correctly. So if I don't... Go ahead. Clarify, okay? You're saying that how you react to my sin... Will cause God to overlook my sin. Right. That is what you're saying. Right. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. I wanted to make sure I was yeah. understanding. Uh, Zach, you agreed with her? Yes. Okay. Well, did you have anything to add? No. Okay. Just... What did you guys think? Well, because it specifically said that it's one that doesn't um, lead to death, right? It specifically said that. Um, I think it would, I 
I know. I, I keep thinking of the whole thing of Jesus on the cross and him saying, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing, you know, mm-hmm. type of thing. You know, if, if I overhear somebody gossiping about me and I know they don't normally gossip, you know, and I pray, you know, you know they, they don't know what they're doing. I, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. So you kind of agree with them? Or Maybe? I don't know. I mean, it's a, it, I'm just asking. Yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to clarify. Confused. Okay. All right. And Nicole, did you have anything to throw into the ring on this one? <laughs> Nicole's like, nah, I'm out. <laughs> Tap out. <laughs> okay, Ben? I, I, I know that you explained this uh, passage to me one time. And so I think that they're wrong, but I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember what you said, but I'm going to go on a loop on a on leap yeah, here. None of this is sounding right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Did you have any ideas, though? No. Okay, That's all right. I asked you about it in the first place. <laughs> okay, all right. All right. Check the game. Man, you guys are being real. <laughs> Close lip. <sighs> okay, so uh, a few things. First off, when someone hardens their heart as a Christian, there's not much you can do in way of discipline for them. And if they can't receive discipline, then their their spirit's going to re- gonna receive a lot of uh, stagnancy. Um, it's it's going to cease to grow, okay? <coughs> because as Christians, we are faulty. We are we make mistakes, and when we do. God designed us in such a way to keep. How, how does Ecclesiastes put it? Iron sharpens iron. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. he, he designed us in such a way where, where fellowship causes us to kind of strengthen each other and keep each other on track. You know what I mean? Right. You know what I mean? Do you guys know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? Yeah. Um, and so when somebody hardens themselves to that, it causes them to kind of reject Christ's leading in their life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Hebrews talks about this too, where he says, um, uh, in Hebrews, sorry, uh, where he says about, um, I wish I could remember exactly how he said it. Um, I think it's in six. Oh, chapter 5, I think. Well, anyways, um, it talks about the way that when someone is truly saved and they reject Christ, you can't restore them to repentance because Christ is the way to, sal- to salvation if they reject Christ. Right. See what I mean? And that, that kind of deals with the same neighborhood here. When, when somebody is a believer... And they turn their back, and they just kind of harden their hearts. God can't plant a seed in rock. Mm. See what I mean? And if you oppose the work of the Holy Spirit in your life, God's not going to be able to move you. And how can He be your master if you're not allowing Him to... See what I mean? And this eventually leads you to die in spirit. You know? Um, And so for those kinds of people, giving them church discipline is a no-go. It's not going to work. But also, what about prayer? Well, for those people who have never been saved, non-believers, okay, you can't pray for them like you would a Christian brother because they're not saved. See what I mean? You can't say, for instance, oh Lord, I pray you would help them through this time of struggling because they they haven't accepted Christ in their life. How can he ex- how can he help them through the time of struggling? Mm-hmm. See what I mean? Mm-hmm. They need to submit their lives to God. In fact, sometimes God brings times of trouble specifically to turn their hearts to Him. So you're kind of praying against God's will. You see what I mean? But then at the same time, uh, once believers, people who, who are now turning their back, you, you can't simply say, Lord, forgive them, because their sin isn't against you, it's against God. And that's the major problem with Diana's theory, um, is because um, our intercessing on somebody else's behalf never was able to resolve the issue because sin comes against God's character. Sin denies who God is. Does that make sense? That kind of 
Um, and so when we react, that's good, and that'll prevent us from falling into sin. But we cannot intercede for someone else's salvation. Mm. See what I mean? Yeah. Only Christ can do that. It has to be Christ, because he alone is God, and he alone is to die in our place. Um, so that takes us back to this que- back to this passage with the question, so what does this mean? So we'll, we'll kind of look at it um, bit by bit. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin, first off, it doesn't specify as to, as to who the sin is to, who was wronged on the sin. Mm-hmm. That's because it doesn't matter who was wronged. What matters is that they're doing something that goes against God's character, mm-hmm. which is sin. Anything against God's character is sin. Um, committing a sin not leading to death. Now, that brings us to the idea of, what does that mean not leading to death? And I think Chuck... <coughs> Now hit this perfectly. I mean, just just perfectly. A sin not leading to death is a sin that someone just. It's a sin, and it's a mistake. But a sin leading to, leading to death is an intentional thing of choosing to step out, and live your own way, because it causes more sin, which causes more sin, which causes you to harden your heart, which causes spiritual death. See what I mean? It gets it gets the 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 rock rolling down the hill to eventually spiritual death. So it's a sin that leads to death. See what I mean? So stay with me here. A sin not leading to death, he shall ask and God will give him life. Now, when we see our, our Christian brothers or sisters or sisters um, mess up and we pray for them, what God does is God gives them grace in the situation to rise above to where they'll be able to come and repent to the Lord. See, when we see our brother sinning, it's our job, it's our duty, it's our responsibility to intercede intercede, intercede to God. Lord, I pray that you would, I would, pray that you would ch- draw a check back. Please don't let this harden his heart. Please, Lord, I pray that you would send your Holy Spirit and comfort him in this time and draw him back to you. And God will give him strength so that he can go and repent. Okay? He will give him life. Um, however, um, he's not talking about uh, um, those who commit sins that do not lead to, lead to death. There is sin that leads to death. Okay, I do not say that one should pray for that. And, and what he's saying here, and we're going to talk about this in Jeremiah, is when someone hardens their heart, you can't pray for God to God give him grace because God will use that to bring by things that, that draw them back in. And when God has set his, set his heart to do something, your prayer, prayers will go ignored if you, go, if you pray for him. For instance, Jesus is coming again. You can pray against it all you want. He's still coming again. doesn't matter what you say or do, Jesus is still coming again. See what I mean? Because God has set in his heart to do this thing. See what I mean? And oftentimes, God will set in his heart to do something. And we'll look at this in Jeremiah. And when we pray against that, we're actually praying against God's will. See what I mean? And we'll look at this in just a second. But let's stay on 1 John for a minute. Um, there is something that says, I do not say that one should pray for that. Basically, what he's saying is, when you see your brother brother sin, pray for him. But when you see your brother turn into a lifestyle of sin, don't pray for God to give him grace, because God's going to use things that will soften his heart. See what I mean? That kind of makes sense? Mm-hmm. Um, and to kind of clarify what I'm talking about here, because I know this might sound a little bit confusing, we're going to go to those passages in Jeremiah, and I sure hope, God, that you guys have them written down, because I don't have all of them written down. Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 16, says this, As for you, do not pray for this people, or lift up a cry, uh, or prayer for them, and do not intercede with me, for I will not hear you. Who is he talking about? Offspring of Ephraim. Who is? You're on the right track. Yes. He's talking about Judah. Remember, Jeremiah was, yeah. was during the time when the northern kingdom of Israel has already fallen. Yeah. And he ministered specifically around the area of Jerusalem, but more broadly to the people of Judah. Um, when Judah fell in 586, he was, a little bit afterwards actually, he was taken to um, Egypt uh, with some people, a long story. But uh, 
going back to the topic here. Uh, <coughs> sorry. Um, God had set in his heart to bring them to, to this time of Judah being destroyed. And he specifically said, don't intercede on their behalf. I'm destroying Judah, and that's that. Do not pray on their behalf. I'm going to ignore your prayers if you do. See, Ju Jeremiah was supposed to pray like this. Lord, I pray that you would cause us to, to draw them near to you. I pray that you would, you would ta cause them to turn from their sin. But he was not supposed to pray like this. Lord, I pray that you would, that you would withdraw your judgment from them. He uh, said, do not intercede on their behalf. He wasn't saying, do not pray at all. He's saying, do not pray or plead their cause before me. Right. That makes sense? Yeah. So, in the, in the same way, this, it kind of goes on in hand in hand with this. When someone is outside of the church, think of it as an umbrella of authority. Say Moses did. Uh, hold that thought. We'll come right back to that, okay? Um, think of it as an umbrella of authority. That's the church, okay? Now, when someone is outside of the umbrella of authority from the church, what happens is they are under the realm of God's wrath. And God will use... God hates sin, remember. And, and remember, when, when, you, when you have and have sin in your life, you're building up wrath in, in an account against God. He is keeping tabs of your wrath to bring it against you. And if you do not repent, on the day of judgment that comes against you, you will be held responsible for those things. But under the, under the authority of the church, you are submitting to God, and not that you're perfect, but God, uh, God uh, what do you say, um, with, withholds judgment that you had deserved because you are covered by the blood of the Lamb. Does that make sense? Mm. Okay. So, uh, to use Old Testament vernacular, he will pass over your house. The Old Testament, you know, Exodus one. Um, but on this, uh, so does that kind of make sense? About the, about that. Um, but, but so what? What? What Paul says um, in First Corinthians is he words it like this. I pray to God that I don't butcher this too badly. Hand them over to Satan for the destruction of the, of the flesh. What does that mean they're no longer under the church's under the church's um, protection? You're, 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 you're purging the evil among you. And once again, we're not talking about people who sinned. In our church, we have had people, um, we have had sexual offenders, we've had um, alcoholics, we've had drug addicts, we've had gossips, we've had all kinds of people in our church. And you know what? They're all welcome. See what I mean? Now, if they go back to that lifestyle, there's going to have to be some one-on-one -on -one discipleship, okay? But if they if they stead, if they steadfastly refuse, there's not much you can do. See what I mean? And once again, there's a difference between kicking someone out of membership, kicking someone out in total, because there are some people who are not allowed back in our church. But there are other people who are not allowed as um, members. But then there are other people who are a member of our church that are still struggling with things. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. it, and once again, it kind of falls into the realm of of what their heart is like. Okay? You're not going to have perfect people, but you will have people who are submitted to God and trying, and people who are not submitted to God and not trying. Okay? So, does that kind of make sense with that? Now, before I get going too far, uh, what, what were you saying about Moses? When God wanted to destroy the people of Israel because he got sick of it, uh -huh. then Moses pleaded before God said, don't. Right, because in that situation, God had not set his heart against um, against the uh, um, set his heart on completely wiping out the people. Mm. See what I mean? Um, but in this situation, he had set his heart against... Uh, I'm saying that wrong. He had set his heart on Judah being destroyed. Mm. He had set his heart to, to, on this thing uh, to be an example to the nations uh, because of the way that they had uh, gone after other gods before all the nations. So he was doing, using this as a time to show the other nations he that that wasn't the way that... He used the way, that as, right, an example. as an example. But then also to cause the people to, to draw into repentance. Right. Now, the, the <laughs> issue with Moses, what had happened, uh, in case, just to make sure we're all on the same page, Moses was on the mountain getting the law from God. Um, God, God sends them back down because they're worshipping uh, uh, some, some idols. It doesn't matter what they were, but the idols. Um, and so Moses gets mad and throws the tablets down, and he makes them eat eat the eat the tablets and water and whatnot. It's a whole long story, but it's just an excess right. if you really want to read it. Um, and God gets so upset that he says, "You know what? I'm just going to use you to you to raise up the, the nation, and all these people are going to die." And uh, G and Moses says, "Look, God, if you do this thing, 
it's going to be against your, your name. Please don't do this for the sake of your own glory and honor. And uh, so God, God relents from, from, his, from what he's going to do. But then he says this, you know what? You guys just go ahead and go. I'm not going with you. Moses says, no, 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 no. please, God, if you don't go with this, uh, you know, this isn't going to work. And so because of that, God draws out a single tribe. Rather than having the whole nation, all 12 tribes as his, as his priests, he draws out a single tribe, the tribe of Levi, which is where we get the book of Leviticus. Um, and um, we're going to get, in, get into this later. But uh, and so that that they had to do their own little thing there. Um, I'm trying to pick and choose what's important. Um, but but remember that was a time. Um, that was something that ha- had happened in a, in a specific thing. But but with this, this has happened generation after generation, and God had had constantly given them grace and mercy. With that, Moses pleaded, and he gave them mercy in that situation. See what I mean? But then later, Moses is going to go and sin against the Lord, and he's not allowed into the promised land. And no matter how many times he asked, God actually told him, don't ask again. Stop asking for this thing. I'm not going to let you in the promised land. That's just that. You you can read that in Deuteronomy. Um, Actually, I think it's in Numbers as well. Um, But does that kind of answer your question? Mm -hmm. Um, But when God sets his heart against something, um, and and he specifically has you not pray for it, that's something else. Um, so, uh, and then down in chapter nine, eleven, maybe. No. Does anybody have those passages written down? Uh, the Jeremiah ones. All you gave us was the was the seven sixteen. Seven sixteen. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, here's another one in eleven fourteen. Therefore do not pray for this people or lift up a cry or prayer on their behalf, for I will not listen when they call, call to me in the time of their trouble. And then he says it one more time. I, I think it's somewhere around 14 or 13. But anyways, and then in chapter 15, verse 1, he says this, Then the Lord said to me, Though Moses and Samuel stood before me, yet my heart would not turn toward this people. Send them out of my sight and let them go. See what had happened was God had set His heart against the, against the the people of Judah because they had consistently had a hard heart towards them, generation after generation, and nobody was doing nobody was doing the right thing, um, and so he he had set it in His heart to do that, and so we're actually called specifically not to do to 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 pray that God would withdraw things like that. We're, we are called to be on, to be in the behalf. Um, what is it called to pray on the behalf of of, pe- of people? Yes, but when God sets His heart to do something. Um, basically, it's kind of a theory of uh, don't get in the way. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, let me give you an example. There's people in this community who are spiritually lost. Not people who knew God and walked away. People are just not, they've never known God in the first place. And so we are interceding for them that God would that God would draw him to himself. You know what I mean? But then there are other people who have had the truth and willfully twisted it for their own sake. I'm speaking, of course, of the Jehovah's Witness. Mm -hmm. They had the truth, and they willfully turned it against God. And so because of that, God's wrath is poured out on them. We aren't supposed to pray that God would withdraw his wrath from them. We're supposed to pray that God would turn their hearts. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's what he's saying. Don't don't oppose my will. And how do we know those things? Because we're praying, Jesus taught us this in, in the Gospel of Matthew, for instance, because we're praying for God's will. Right? And as we pray, God kind of quickens to our hearts what to pray and what not to pray. You know what I mean? Um, we were in a meeting the other day and we were talking about something and all three of us had come to the same conclusion without ever talking to each other about it. Well, why is that? Because we're all under the same God. See what I mean? So, um, 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 8. Um, we will still allow a lot of times people uh, into our services, um, but not as members or persistent um Attenders, uh, let me kind of clarify that. If someone's causing problems, we don't let them back. But if someone, let's say, um, is in a sin and we kick them out, uh, there are some exceptions where they're allowed back, you know, for, for a time. Obviously, if they don't change their heart and if they continue to make problems, um, it's going to be a, a persistent no. But, you know, there's all, obviously that thing there. Um, and like I say, with church discipline, there's really, it's not as black and white as it is with social justice. Um, it's oftentimes a lot more slow 
And in fact, sometimes when you act too quickly in a church situation, it just causes church splits. Because this is what people do. And never forget this. People get set in their heart as to who's right and wrong before they even know the details. And they will side with whoever they just like more as a person, regardless of truth or fact. And so, as a church leader, you have to be sensitive to that, because let's say, for instance, Chuck, Chuck and Grace are chummy chummy, right? But then let's say Gracie does all kinds of stuff, and, and, and she needs to be dealt with, and she's going to draw Chuck, who in turn, let's say, is best friends with Zach. So, I mean, so this whole big stink is going to be caused, or you can handle it with tact. I'm not saying don't handle it, but handle it with tact. And sometimes, handling things with wisdom and discernment take sometimes even years. So, I mean, so... Um. So if you are really free, God does a work in your life over time, and you eventually abandon the ways of the world. Uh, don't intercede uh, for mercy for those who have hardened their hearts against God. Rather, ask God to change their heart. Um, that's another thing about the people of uh, that, that that can be mentioned about the people in Exodus is they hadn't hardened their hearts towards God. They just hadn't set their hearts onto God. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, throughout the course of time, they will harden their hearts towards God, as recorded in the book of Numbers, and they're not allowed to enter the promised land because of it. Um, but they hadn't yet. Um, so the question then becomes, is it good for everyone or just them? You know, with, with church discipline, with prayer, you can't pray up based off of things that you personally desire. Let's say, for instance, Chuck's my kid, and Chuck's doing all kinds of things, and so I try to show him mercy. And let's say I find pot in his room. Well, is it really good for him if I keep covering for him? No. no. I'm actually causing him to have more of a problem. Uh -huh. you know what I mean? And although it's a hard decision to make, the better decision to make is the harder decision. Right. Either kick him out or report him, but you can't keep covering. aiding and embedding. Yeah. So, I mean, is that illegal? But also, that's just plain stupid. Right. And you're just going to cause somebody to, to mess up more. Yeah. And it's kind of the same thing. Um, so, uh, let's just persecute you. I mentioned that. Uh, relations. Do what's right with patience. We talked about that. We already talked about the, that. Peace and grace. See, like, for instance, in the, in the issue of homosexuality, do you preach peace and grace? Because, hey, even if you are, if you are inclined to homosexuality, there is, there is room for you at the, at the cross. Or, do you preach repentance? You just need to straighten up your act. See what I mean? It's not as easy as it as it sounds, especially in light of the thing that some people genuinely just are not attracted to the opposite sex. I mean, what are you gonna do for that? Tell them they're going to hell. <laughs> See what I mean? Like, how can how can you make the gospel relatable to people who are genuinely lost? Mm -hmm. See, it's easier to live in a world of black and white. You can just stop being homosexual if you wanted to. Um, there, there, there's no exception to to uh, uh, a sexual to a sexual sin. Oh well, if you really wanted to get off drugs, you could. Uh, you see what I mean? It's it's easier to do stuff like that. But reality isn't really that black and white. It, it often deals in a gray area that, as Christians, is very hard to navigate through. If you really want to want to be encouraged, read First Corinthians. They had completely lost track of where the gray zone was. <laughs> Anyways. Um, so discipline is not for non-believers. We are not called to go out and, and, and whatever in the world. It's also not for uh, once believers who have hardened their hearts. Rather, we should be praying that they should repent. And in our prayers, remember that we are not called to pray against... Some people just have a contentious spirit, and they try to pray against God on everything. Like, I imagine there would probably be someone nowadays, who, if this was given the word to them, they would have just ignored it. You told me not to pray on their behalf. God, I pray that you would, that you would relent from your wrath against Judah. Didn't he just tell you not to do that? See, I mean, he never told Moses not to pray, not to pray for the people, did he? He just told them, told them he was going to destroy them, and he did seize that opportunity um, to stand in their gap. But does that make, kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. So, with prayer, make sure that you're not praying your will. Okay, that's the biggest thing. Thing with prayer, do not pray your will. Pray God's will. Okay. Um, sometimes I, I know we like to pray like that, Lord, that you would that you would not bring punishment on this person. It's not about our will. It's about God's will. Mm -hmm. And we're not supposed to pray for destruction for people, and we're not supposed to pray that God would withdraw destruction from people. We're supposed to pray that the lost would be found, that God would send laborers to the vineyard, right? Mm -hmm. 
See what I mean? We need to start praying God's way and stop trying to pray things and make us feel comfortable with the world. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Oh, well, this person's just just lost, Lord, that you just, you know, look past it while they're, while they're what? See what I mean? You, you're not supposed to make excuses for sin. So, um, the, the two realms of deception we've talked about, discipline from the church is for Christians, discipline from God is for non-believers and rebellious Christians. Okay? Mm-hmm. So just kind of in summation. Oh, there, there they are. 14.1 uh, was the other one. Ha-ha! Fourteen one? I don't think that's right, buddy. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't know, but I don't think fourteen one is right. Maybe fourteen eleven. Ah, yeah, fourteen eleven. Do not pray for the welfare of this people. Ha! So once again, all three are a little bit worded differently. Don't pray for the welfare of this people. Um, but uh, and then that brings us to the last thing here. Rebellion is as of the sin of witchcraft. Okay. I want you to understand the severity there. If God put the church in rain, and he specifically said that as you bring discipline to people where two or three are gathered, I am there in the midst of you. I think he's taking church discipline a little seriously, don't you? Mm-hmm. So don't you think that when he brings people by to discipline you, to bring you back into correct relationship with him, and you reject that, don't you think that that's kind of a serious deal to God? First, First Samuel fifteen twenty three talks about this. Rebellion is as of the sin of witchcraft. See what I mean? Oh, it's not like I offered a sacrifice to Satan, but you rebelled against God. See what I mean? And that conjures the wrath of God on you. And a lot of times, parents do this a lot too. Their kids will be doing something bad and they'll just always try to, oh God, keep them from that bad thing. But what if that bad thing causes them to turn their hearts back to God? What if God has ordained that bad thing to draw them back? See what I mean? Yeah. What if God has set in his heart that this is the thing that he's doing and you are standing in the way? Well, then what's going to happen? Let me just clue you in here. The wrath of God is going to come on you until you get out of the way. What? <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. Because even though you're not the one who's rebelling, you are in the way of God's will. And when God has set his heart to do something, get out of the way. <laughs> Let him do the thing that he said he's going to do. Goodness sakes. That's like saying, okay, God said that Jesus is going to come back, and I don't want Jesus to come back. So I'm going to try and get people unsaved, and I'm going to try to uh, prolong the earthly government as long as possible. What? what? <laughs> See what I mean? That's just plain stupidity. So, uh, and we're, we're finishing up here, last slide here. Um, so that takes us to the other aspect of, of discipleship, self-discipline. This is, this is the thing that we're going to be looking at for the next couple of weeks. As Christians, as a disciple of Christ, we are supposed to be submitting ourselves constantly. I had a professor in college who said it like this. Always reinvent yourself. And what he mentioned, what he was talking about was, have you ever met one of those people who are like 50 and they're the same person for the past 20 years, not doing anything for the kingdom? Not growing, not not, not spiritually, they're, they're in the same spot. You know what I mean? Reinvent yourself. Don't allow yourself to become that person. Constant self-examination. Everything you do, say, say think. Always examine yourself. Always be ready. Be, be ready. Lord, Lord, show me what I can change. Lord, change me. Keep Making me into you. The instant that you think that you are, you are, you have arrived. Trust me, you haven't. Um, uh, w- with finances, are you fine? And we're going to talk about this later. But are your finances submitted to God? Are they where God wants them to be? Um, <clears throat> food and entertainment. Uh, are you, I know, for instance, I had a really stressful year. <laughs> I I compensated with food. See what I mean? Was that a wise thing to do? No. Disci- d- disciples, see, I messed up, but now it's my job to get back on track. See what I mean? You guys get what I'm saying? Well, it's just food. No, because it's a lifestyle of discipline to the Lord. I'm not going to find my peace in drugs, in food, in sex, in, in pornography. I'm not going to find my th- find my peace in that. I'm going to find my peace in Christ. See what I mean? And anything that is a vice is in the way of your growing relationship with Christ. Um, entertainment, I know a lot of people who, who use PS4s as their spirituality, I mean, goodness sakes, PS3s, Wii's, um, work, I, I see a lot of people overworking, in this area I see more people underworking, but I do see a lot of, I have seen a lot of people overworking in California, for exa- example, mm-hmm. where work is their life, mm-hmm. that's all, all there is in life, it's like, well, okay, uh, that's not a disciplined way of living, is it, 
when your whole world revolves around work, that's not disciplined living. That's that's what the world has, but that's not what God has in store for you. Um, spiritual dis- development that that you are holding yourself to a life of, to a life of, of of devotion of growth. Who keeps you in line for reading the Bible every day and for praying? Well, you do. Self discipline um, in relationships. I already kind of talked about this earlier, and we're going to talk about it earlier, so I don't really want to get too much into it, but the idea of, of, of keep, um, submitting your life in discipline to God. I mean, there's self-discipline and there's church discipline. You submit to those who God has over you and, you, and you always hold yourself accountable to God. Because if you've died to sin, why live to sin? Okay? So, um, the, we have on September 6th through 26th, the church fast. Um, I want to encourage you guys to do something like my fast. What my fast is, is I am not buying myself anything that besides like the, the food that you have to have like to eat. But I'm not buying myself anything like Amazon wish list or anything like that. I'm not buying myself anything. I'm not going out to eat. I'm not doing anything like that. I'm doing the bare minimum, minimum of spending that I po- humanly possibly can. And, uh, yeah. And why? Because it, that's a difficult thing to do <laughs> for me. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but I have a lot of things on my Amazon wish list. <laughs> and, uh, but to say no, I'm not going to do that. You know what I mean? I want you guys to do something like that for your fast, something that challenges you. Um, something that's hard for you. Don't do something to fast that, that's easy. Like, let's say you hate eating. Like, what is that called? Anorexic? Well, let's say you're anorexic. Well, fasting from food isn't going to do much good for you, is it? No. See what I mean? Find something that you actually struggle with. I struggle with buying myself stuff and eating out a lot. So I'm not doing that. <laughs> See what I mean? I took the kids to acquire the fire one time, and uh, I wanted them to fast for just, you know, sometime during that week before we went, any day, pick a day, you know. This girl says, uh, can I fast Burger King? Do you like Burger King? (laughs) No, I like McDonald's. It's fast McDonald's. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So the question of the week, what is addiction? Um, and I don't want you guys to think about just a simple answer. I want you guys to actually think about this. What is addiction? Um, if you have to look up psych- different psychology books, um, that's totally fine. I'm sure the library in Alamo might have something uh, with it being so close to, with it being having an MSUA there. So, um, what is addiction? It should, right? Doesn't that sound like a thing? 